go to Matthew. Go, 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 go to Matthew 27, 45. Are you still here? Nudge your neighbor and say, it's okay to use your Bible a bit at church. It's okay to do that. Look at this. Go to Matthew 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now the significance of that is once again that Jesus had had perfect communion with the Father. He had never been separated from the Father and sin separates you from God. He never sinned. So when your sin and mine is laid upon him, he for the first time experiences that separation from the Father. And he cries out, La, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. And he's actually speaking in a language other than the one he learned. Which is why the Bible says this has to be interpreted. So he is not speaking in the language of the people who are listening to him. Now, why is that? Because for the first time, Jesus actually speaks with other tongues a tongue that he had not learned. And the reason he speaks for the first time in a tongue that he had not learned is now he is for the first time experiencing the same separation that you and I being born in sin caused us to experience. And now in order for his spirit to communicate with his God, he's gotta bypass his natural realm and speak to his father in the spirit. That's why even the writer says, this being interpreted meaning, this wasn't a language we understood. And that's why the people who were looking at him said, well, he must be calling Elijah. If he was speaking their language, they would have known what he said. But because Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani sounds like Elijah, they say he's calling Elijah. No, he's doing what you and I get to do. He's speaking in another language, in an unknown tongue. I don't have time to preach that today. But for the first time, for the first time, he is experiencing the separation from God that sin affects. And so he cries out, Lama, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabakta, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right. And the Bible declares, watch this. Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Look at verse number 48. I got to hurry. Immediately, one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him. And I read that to get you to see that we're talking about the same time and the same event that John recorded. But Matthew gives us another piece of information. Are you still here? Immediately one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Look at the very next verse. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now why does the Bible tell us at that very moment, the very moment when he said it is accomplished, the very moment when he said tetelestai, the very moment when he said paid in full, the very moment when he settled the account and closed the book, the Bible says at that very moment, the veil in the temple is torn from top to bottom. Notice the accuracy of the Holy Spirit. He leaves no stone unturned. He says it is torn from top to bottom. Why is that important? Because it was a very tall veil. It went to the ceiling and no man could climb up there and tear it. So the fact that he says it was torn from top to bottom means it was a divine tearing, not a human one. One. No man tore it. God tore it. Now what is the significance of this? Once a year, the high priest would have to come back into the holy of holies behind the veil. Look at your neighbor and say, where nobody can see. And offer the blood of bulls and goats on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. And for one year more, the sin of the nation was atoned for, but only for a year. And the Hebrew writer then begins to show us that Jesus, after he gives up the ghost, 
begins to function as your and my high priest. Now, what we don't see is another piece of information that Peter tells us about in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 18 and 19. I didn't give that to them back there, but if you can find it, put it up. Because just as in the natural, the high priest went behind the veil, look at your neighbor and say, and nobody could see him. And when he went back there, he was doing the things that the high priest has to do in order to make the sacrifice acceptable and secure the atonement for the people. According, uh, according, to, second, uh, according to Second Peter, is that what I want? Uh, I don't think that's what I want. What did I say? Second Peter what? Go to 19. No, 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 go to 19. Okay, then go to 1 Peter 3, 19. Yeah, now go up to 18. Put them both on there, 18 and 19. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now we're talking about high priestly function. Just as the high priest would go into the holy of holies where nobody could see and work out the atonement, the Bible declares that the moment that Jesus gives up the ghost, his flesh dies, but by the spirit he goes and preaches to the spirits in prison. The spirits held captive. Who are these? These are the old covenant saints who have not yet been able to come into heaven because the price has not been paid in full. It is not fully accomplished. And so he leaves his body. And the Bible says he goes into the lower parts of the earth. Ephesians tells us he that ascended, what is it also that he first descended in the lower parts of the earth? Peter tells us that when he descended, he goes and preaches to the spirits held captive. Who are these? This is Moses, Daniel, David, Elijah, Elisha. This is Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. This is Jeremiah, Isaiah, who are waiting for the tetelestai. They're waiting for the thing to be paid in full. And the Bible says that when he leaves there, he takes captivity captive. He leads a procession out of there, in essence saying to Satan, I believe you have something that belongs to me. Give me the keys to death, to hell, and to the grave. And he he alerts a supernatural jailbreak. And all the men and women who died in faith, believing that Messiah would come and pay for it, they take a procession out of that place. And Moses and Abraham and David and Daniel and Ezekiel and Elijah follow him out, free at last. Watch it. Grab your neighbor's hand, tell them I'm talking about the resurrection. Now, this is what it does. And so, and so, so the Hebrew writer says, the high priest in the natural had to do this once a year. He had to go in every year with the blood of a bull and make a sacrifice. But this man, who was the only one who was qualified to pay. And this is why there is not salvation in any other. (laughs) This is why Confucius can't do this for you. And Buddha can't do this for you. And Muhammad cannot do this for you. Smart as they were, they were not qualified to go in and pay the price. Only this man could do that. Only his blood. Oh, you don't like me now. I thought I was in a, a, a church where, no, 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 you know, I'm open-minded. I'm open-minded to Christ's mind. 
and somebody's got to tell you, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name given under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved, but the name of Jesus. He is the way, not a way. He is the way, the truth, the life. And no man comes to the Father except by him. Because he was the only one qualified to be the Passover lamb and the Yom Kippur high priest. And so the Bible declares, watch it now. And so the Bible declares this man, after he had made one sacrifice for sin, after he had made one sacrifice for sin, look at your neighbor and say, one after he had made one sacrifice for sin. He sits down. At the right hand of God. Now again, because we are not schooled in Hebraic tradition, most of the Western church does not really understand the significance of this action. But the reality is that every Jew knew that there is no seat behind the veil. There is no seat for the high priest in the natural temple. There is no place for him to sit down. And the reason there is no place for him to sit down is because he is never finished. He has to go back next year. So there's no need to sit down when you got to get up again and do it again. The fact of the matter that the Bible says that you're in my high priest sat down is evidence that he was saying it is finished. Pay in full, no more sacrifices. Grab your neighbor's hand and tell him, do you understand what this means? Do you understand? Do you understand that this means you can come to God freely? You can come to him without price. That you don't have to come afraid. You don't have to be scared. You don't have to fear his judgment, his condemnation. You don't have to fear his wrath. There is nowhere you've been, nothing you have done that has not been paid for by that one sacrifice. That means I don't have to come to God making deals. I don't have to promise him I'll never do it again. I don't have to tell him, God, please, one more time, because he'll answer you and say, I'll do it a million times. I'll forgive you a million times. <laughs> look at look at your neighbor and say, my savior is chilling. He's chilling. He's he, he, he's chilling. And the reason he is chilling is because he knows it has forever been settled. Your sin forever dealt with. Grab your neighbor's hand. Look at him squarely in the eye and say, to tell us die. If I had the time, I would preach to you that Jesus is an overpayment for your sins. <laughs> he didn't just settle the books, he overpaid. Look at your neighbor and say, he overpaid. He overpaid. 